we're going to talk about how to get data into smart contracts. Normally, it's quite easy to build applications on top of blockchain that only get data from the blockchain. That's not a difficult thing. It becomes a bit more complicated when you want to get real world data into your smart contracts, into your dApps. And therefore, I want to welcome Sergey Nazarov from Chainlink to talk more about how this works and about Chainlink. So a big applause, a big welcome for Sergey. Great, thank you. Hi everyone, hope, uh, hope the conference is going well, uh, well for you. So what, um, what we'll be covering today is gonna be a very specific problem. So it's the problem of how does data, and more importantly, data that shows that something happened in the real world interact with smart contracts. So the, the reality is that smart contract environments like Ethereum, Hyperledger, and all, pretty much all the others, many of the, the initial variants, can't talk to APIs. APIs are application programming interfaces. They're how systems, um, web applications, Uber, um, you know, all these different systems, how they talk to data. Now, smart contracts can't actually interact with data. And if they can't interact with data, they can't know what happened, right? So what this means is that if you can't get market data into a contract, if you can't get IoT data into a contract, if you can't get shipping data into a contract, you can't write a contract about those events. The, the thing you can write a contract about right now is about tokens. Because the token-related data is generated on-chain, and it's consistently added to on-chain. So the reason you can make token contracts, and you can, can make, make them change, and you can, you can affect them from, from a smart contract, is because all the data already exists on-chain. Now. That's pretty much, uh, in, in my opinion, that's why our space is defined by tokens. It's defined by tokens because uh, that's what you can do, right? Every, every time you give developers something they can do, um, you, you give it to them at a high enough level of usability and security guarantees, they, uh, they begin doing those things. So I think if we give developers uh, a greater degree of capabilities to interact with all these external events, market events, shipping events, IoT events, will give them the ability to build a whole new category of contracts. So, so just to, to clarify this point a little more, let, let's look at how um, our space has evolved, right? So the way that our space has evolved is that we went uh, from Bitcoin multi-signature to something called protocol smart contracts in about 2013 and 14. This is when I started building smart contracts. This is basically when you could start building them, when you gave developers the capability to use any kind of smart contract. This created the first generation of tokens and, and decentralized applications because developers could actually build a smart contract at all. But their capacity to do that was very limited. Um, it, it, the security was limited. The, the usability of doing that process actually took months because you had to get every new smart contract into a protocol. Ethereum successfully, and, and, and basically Ethereum, by introducing scriptable smart contracts, took us from these opcode-based model contract uh, platforms, and it, it took us to a model where instead of months to, to make a smart contract, it now took you days, right? But once again, the only thing that you could really build was tokens. So you, you got the space to a point where you could securely and quickly build uh, tokenization. Everybody built tokenization, and our space is 90% defined by tokens, right? So that's, that's the transition that we've recently gone through, right? The next transition that, that we think will happen, the, the next logical step, is the ability to use scriptable smart contract platforms like Ethereum and, and other environments to interact with events. Right? If, you, if you look at how digital agreements actually work in the, in the non-blockchain world, the vast majority of digital agreements are about an event, delivery of a good, some kind of market price change for a derivative or financial product, IoT data for insurance, and the next logical step in the evolution of our, of our space is the ability to write smart contracts about events. And, and that's really the, the next step in the space's evolution that, that we're focused on, make, focused on making possible. Now, that's, that's basically what we work on. We, we provide something called middleware. Middleware, um, in, in the case of blockchains, has to have a very high security threshold, right? Because the security of the of the smart contract also depends on its connection with events. 
we create secure blockchain middleware for getting external data into contracts so they can at all be, be written at all about some external event so that contracts can interact with external systems like payment systems and so that contracts can interact with other various environments like other chains. So that's, that's the body of work that we specialize in and we focus on. What we've seen in the process of building many of these oracles and a lot of this middleware for different environments has been that uh, what we're really doing is we're expanding what we define as a smart contract. So if a smart contract right now is defined as something that m manipulates token data, then you only care about the security of the platform that houses the token data and the code to, to manipulate it. But if you're saying that you're expanding how you define a contract to include events, both the inclusion of external events and the generation of external events, you're, you're now saying that I have more features and I have more capabilities, but I also have more surface area. So I have a new piece of a smart contract's life cycle uh, of its end-to-end -end architecture that I need to secure. If you don't secure this new piece and you just say, you know, it's not no big deal, then you take a huge risk because you, you've just introduced an entire new part of your smart contract that completely controls its outcomes. So the, the reality is that it's very exciting to increase what smart contracts can do, but this creates the need to secure that new capability, and, and that's essentially the, the, the difficult uh, body of work that, that, that we're focused on, um, well, in, in the process of successfully bringing, bringing to a kind of a conclusion where people in this space can make a contract that's secure end-to-end, -end, from inputs to computation to outputs. The, the way that we do this is we apply, uh, I mean, there, there's a few key tenets to how we, we, we do this, but at, at, at the most fundamental level, we apply decentralization. So what decentralization does is it allows us to take the same security model that secures smart contract state on systems like Ethereum or, or other blockchain networks, and it applies uh, the capacity to have multiple independent node operators validating inputs as oracles, right? So you have multiple independent node operators securing the state of the contract, and in our system you have multiple independent node operators provably securing the inputs into the contract. The security of these inputs um, is actually very often in, in, in our system or in our model is, and, and this is a model we'd be thrilled to have feedback on, so if you, if you have an opinion on this, I'd be thrilled to, to chat with you during the conference. Um, the model that we have is that an oracle exists to service a specific contract. And that oracle servicing that contract means that there needs to be a binding service agreement. Binding service agreements basically force the oracle to create clarity about what it's going to be doing for a contract. And this clarity provides security guarantees to the creator of the contract and also to the people that are using the contract because they also need security guarantees. Nobody's going to put large amounts of money into contracts that they don't have security guarantees for. Uh, the ability to have multiple node operators that secure in this binding service agreements fashion generates a lot of data. This data uh, is about the commitment that Oracle made to a contract and their fulfillment of that commitment. And all of that data is something we use to achieve provable, what we call provable security. And provable security is where we can have a certain amount of proof that an Oracle is indeed good at delivering data and has a high likelihood that it will continue to deliver data and do computation reliably. Beyond the, our ability to generate some provable security, we also practice something called defense in depth. Um, defense in depth is when you layer on multiple security approaches. Uh, in our case, it's decentralization, trusted execution environments, and now we're in the late stages of implementing zero knowledge proofs and in the, in the early to middle stages of uh, looking at homomorphic encryption. So defense in depth means that you layer on multiple security approaches, um, some of which I'll have time to go into, some of which I, I, don't, I don't have enough time, unfortunately, today. And all of this is done by a large open source community that writes the core code, writes the integration code, and a, secure, a security researcher and academic community that we heavily collaborate with. So actually, if you're a security researcher or an academic and, and you have feedback on our system, well, you know, we're very open-minded. We, we, we're always thrilled to have an informed dialogue, and we are, we're excited to, and interested to hear your feedback. Now, I think now that we have a general picture, it's probably useful to look at uh, slightly more specifics about the problem we're seeking to solve. So at, at, at the core level, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take decentralized computation and maintain its security in connection to an external system. But 
the model of decentralized computation is that there isn't a single point of failure, right? So the, the, the fundamental problem is if I want to pass data about an event into a decentralized computational environment, um, and I do it in a way that isn't, um, isn't fault tolerant, isn't, isn't resistant to all kinds of tampering, or, 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 the or doesn't give you the security properties that decentralized computation does, then the average security of my smart contract becomes very low. And the weak point, um, at, you know, at this point in the space's evolution, the weak point is definitely this oracle, right? So this is the problem. After going to production and going live months ago, we've, we've successfully, in our opinion, solved this problem, where now you can have multiple uh, independent node operators being selected to provide highly reliable inputs into a smart contract to provide you the same level of guarantees that you get about the smart contract's reliability. This interaction between those node operators and the contract is um, very clearly formalized, uh, and it, it forces a commitment from the Oracle about what they'll be doing, how long they'll be doing it for, the quality at which they'll be doing it. And, and all of these commitments um, essentially f give the Oracle a lot of reason to, to properly follow through on the delivery of data, which, which once again is absolutely critical to a contract that depends on that data, because that's what tells the contract what it should do. Right? The contract now exists in essentially two parts, in the on-chain part and in the off-chain part. And the security of the off-chain part is equally important. Now, once you have decentralization at this middleware level, you can start to achieve decentralization at the data level. And we also enable that because we were actually integrated with a large amount of data providers. One of these data providers is CoinMarketCap, and we're, we're thrilled to be working uh, with them as one of our official data providers. They're very often used in our system, and they've been you know, triggering high-quality decentralized financial projects through us for some time now. So uh, now that we have some level of um, clarity on, 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 on the core problem and, and how it, it's, it's solved, I think it's useful to go at another level of detail and look at how does a data provider like CoinMarketCap reliably provide data to trigger um, a decentralized financial contract. So the way that looks in our model is the relationship between the user contract and the Oracle is extremely defined. So we actually have jobs for every single piece of data that you, you could want to get from a specific API, and node operators commit to perform those jobs. Users then select from a large collection of node operators uh, that have different levels of security guarantees, depending on the user's budget, that they want to pay for different levels of security. Those node operators provide uh, essentially a decentralized method for executing the relevant jobs. So you have a way to define the work that a data provider will perform for you. You have a way to get an oracle to commit to perform that work. And you have a way to do that for multiple oracles, as well as for multiple data providers, to, to essentially arrive at, at what we would consider a fully decentralized financial product, right? This is an example. This is uh, the start of an architecture diagram for a fully decentralized financial product that people could reliably put hundreds of millions of dollars into. And um, the reality is that the one that you would actually want to put a lot of money into would not have three oracles. It would have many more. It would have probably at least 21 or 57 or, or, or some large amount of oracles. Now. All of these oracles fulfilling, committing to and fulfilling these um, service agreements also generates a lot of data. So the, the, the part of our system that, that I find more and more fascinating is how much data we're able to generate about the relationship between an oracle and a smart contract, and how that data, being extremely reliable because it's on chain, both in the form of the commitment and the performance, um, creates a picture of the, of the security of that oracle. Over time, that data uh, provides guarantees about that Oracle's reliability, together with all kinds of other um, proofs of identity, proofs of audit from penetration testing firms, proof about what environment the node operator is running. And all of these additional pieces of proof about the security of the node operator are also attested to in a, in a very verifiable public key manner. So essentially, you arrive at a place where you can, can validate whether a node operator is, is reliable. Now, once you validate that the node operator is reliable, once you have a way, as you do right now, to define the work you want to do with it, uh, what happens is what we're seeing now, right? So what we're seeing now is more decentralized financial products, gaming products, insurance products start using specific oracles. So as all of those different users use oracles, they create something called a web of trust. And in the web of trust model, the more users you have, 
And the more um, provably separate users you have, the more you can prove separation from your users, the more you can prove civil resistance, the more proof you have that these high quality users are utilizing you as the way that their contract functions correctly. So this means that over time, you, you arrive at a system where you have somebody who can prove that they've delivered cryptocurrency price data successfully a million times. And that they, they, they and, and so you have a high degree, and, and you know they've delivered it to 50 other applications, you know what those applications are, you know that they're run by high quality teams, and so now you are in a position where you can rely on an Oracle, and you can define the work with them very quickly. What, what we think all of this will essentially result in is the ability for smart contract developers to build something like this, not in a matter of months, but in a matter of hours, right? So the, the, the goal for us is to create an environment where if you wanted to build an, a contract about, smart, uh, about crop insurance, a, a smart contract that basically pays farmers depending on rainfall, you should be able to do that as a, as a smart contract developer in, in, in a number of hours just like a web developer is able to build a web app in a number of hours, right? You should be able to write your core code, define the relationships you need with external systems, and have the security guarantees that you need for people to use your decentralized application, both on the level of your contract, on the level of the inputs, and, the, and also the outputs. So the, the goal of this body of work is generating an environment where smart contract developers can build smart contracts at the same speed as web developers by connecting to all these external systems, but still provide the security guarantees that make smart contracts such a unique form of digital agreement.